Well, good morning to one and all. Nice to have, have you here and to be here with you at this uh, worship hour. And uh, just to, I was going to greet someone who's not here. <laughs> Steve, uh, Steve Keith has been with us uh, in, in a lockdown situation and he was going to be here today. And I think his plane is just about to fly out or something, isn't it? So. He may be back anyway. But uh, anyway, Steve, wherever you are, nice to have, have, had you, have had you for an hour or two this morning. Um, it's also very nice to see you, uh, uh, Trish and uh, Kevin, and I know that you've been going through a lot this week, haven't you, with your son, uh, Troy, over in the uh, mainland, who's uh, had a surgery, I think, this week, a very important surgery. And the Lord has been sustaining you, I know, uh, in prayer. I don't know if there's been an update in any of that, has there, but... Uh, We'd be glad to find out. Perhaps. Yeah, well, as he wants to take his route out, which I was very grateful about, and uh, they got the surgery done, so he's been very well. Yeah. Um, and so there's been some encouraging news, and we're glad for that, Trish. We really are. We'll continue to support you in prayer. Thank you for your prayers. Sure, sure. So there are one or two other things I'd just like to quickly draw your attention to. Uh, there are several things happening this morning that are rather special. Uh, one of those is that uh, uh, national church leaders around Australia have called this weekend a special weekend of prayer for the, uh, the, the pandemic crisis, the COVID crisis that we're facing. It's a very serious situation. Even New Zealand, Julie was telling me, is, uh, is suffering today, I think, aren't they? They're trying to, to chase down the Delta variant as well. Uh, so we are wanting to make this a special matter of prayer. The Anglican Church tomorrow will do that, as will the uh, Uniting Church and uh, All Nations Church with uh, Pastor Rusi. But today we will be doing it. And we will have a special season of prayer where we will invite as many as who would like to to, in, in, to uh, intercede with God for the situation that we're facing. The other thing that's very special today. Aha, yes. uh -huh, okay, okay. Yes, it's a common concern, I think, for all those who name the name of Jesus. The other thing that's special about today is that uh, in the Adventist Church across the globe, uh, it is being designated abuse prevention day this is a day when the church recognizes that abuse is a big issue it is in the church as well as it is everywhere else and uh, the presentation that you will see this morning is a video presentation of somebody in america uh, who has a lot of experience in this it's, it's, it's actually quite a confronting uh, presentation but i think one that is very well worth listening to so those are the two special things that we will be doing this morning just one or two other things to draw to, you, draw to your attention. Uh, the, um, uh, the women's prayer group, the, the inaugural women's prayer group, will happen on Sunday the 29th of August. That's not this Sunday, but the following Sunday at our home at 3 o'clock. Ladies, welcome. And uh, we would really like to see you there for that. The, uh, the prayer meeting on, Sun at, uh, on Tuesday evening at 7.15 continues in our meditation on the, the Lord's Prayer, we're now up to the uh, part where we pray, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And uh, we are discovering a great depth in, in all of the Lord's Prayer, which is so easily said, but uh, there, is, there is very much to think about in that. I think that that's all for this morning. Um, but no, there's one more thing. I noticed as we were looking at uh, the list of birthdays, that August is birthday month for the Norfolk Church. I think there are five birthdays in February and there are five in May, but there are six in August. That includes Peter Summerscales, who you were on the first, I think, weren't you? And uh, Alan Patterson, who's not here at the moment, on the third, and then Roy and Lance um, Laurie, I think, on the 17th, Di on the 18th, and Leonie today. 
So look, in keeping with uh, the Norfolk tradition, we would like to sing happy birthday to you. And I'd like to do something just a little additional to that. I'd like us also in keeping with the island tradition to acknowledge the blessing of God in your life. So after we've sang happy birthday, why don't we sing praise God from whom all blessings flow as well. Okay? Happy birthday. <laughs> Thanks to God for his blessings in your life. Praise God from whom all blessings It is now our privilege as a gathered family to worship God. And I'd just like to read a couple of scriptures with you which remind you of our privilege. In the book of Revelation, we are told that another angel was flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth. But he's saying with a loud voice, fear God, give glory to him. The hour of his judgment has come. And worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea and the springs of waters. And the next one. So, I'd like you to read this with me. O oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our Maker. For he is our God. And we are the people of his pasture the sheep of his hand. So folks, as we sing the worshippers prayer, and I invite you to rise and sing this, sing this from your heart as a prayer to the Lord this morning. Come Holy Spirit, I need you. over and over in your scripture that we are precious to you that you bought us with an infinite price that we are your special treasure our father please send your spirit to us this morning awaken these truths in our hearts so that our hearts will be filled with with gratitude and humility for the gifts of your grace we pray in jesus name Now, a privilege to be led in praise and worship this morning, to sing and to make melody in our hearts to the Lord.
as you come to the cross, of course, you, it moves nicely into this next hymn, Take the World, but Give Me Jesus. As Roger indicated earlier, we have a special focus today in our prayer time, being the COVID-19 uh, pandemic in particular. But I'd also uh, like to add in there the uh, situation in Kabul and what's happening there, um, and not just for Christians either, but for the Muslim folk as well, um, everybody there. And uh, if we could also remember Troy, that's Trisha's uh, son, and Jim, that's Liz's husband. And uh, what we'd like to do is to have a season of prayer, and by that I mean that as we kneel together and pray, I'll ask uh, Denise to uh, lead, um, and then feel free to join in. And uh, after, a, after it feels like everyone's had a turn, then I will close at the end, all right? So can I, I invite you to uh, kneel in prayer, please. Heavenly Father, we come humbly to your throne this morning, Lord, on your Sabbath day. We come, Lord, as your people to worship you and to give you honour and praise. Father God, we want to pray for what is happening around the world, Lord, so much violence, so much evil, particularly on the mainland, Lord, with COVID and the crisis that's happening right there in New South Wales, particularly in Sydney. We come, Lord, and ask that you will bring much peace to the hearts of those that are suffering, Lord. We pray for those that are in, um, in the medical field, Lord, the paramedics and the doctors and the nurses. Father God, give them strength. Help them to know exactly what to do, Father, to, to bring healing to those that come into hospital. Lord, we pray for the situation in Kabul and Afghanistan. We ask, Father, that you'll protect the Christians that are there hiding from the Taliban. We pray, Heavenly Father, that you will give 
the uh, those that are uh, going into Kabul to uh, rescue these people, Lord, please give them much wisdom as to how best to proceed. Mm -hmm. So, Lord, we just we just come as a group of people to you, Lord, because you have said that you hear our prayers, Lord, and we ask you, Father, that our prayers will ascend to the throne and that your will be done in our lives as it is in heaven. We pray for the blood of Jesus over us, Lord, mm -hmm. and for his keeping. Mm -hmm. So thank you, Father. May we, uh, may you find our prayers pleasing to you, Lord. Mm -hmm. Oh, God, we ask in the name of Jesus. Mm -hmm. Our gracious and loving Father, we um, count it a privilege, Lord, to kneel before you. We um, seek your, your, your hand, Lord, as a the sad state of affairs, Lord, that uh, this world is in. And, uh, Lord, we pray for um, those that are caught up in the, in the COVID pandemic, especially in Sydney and, and New South Wales and also in Victoria as well and further afield. And we, Lord, we also pray for people that are caught up in this in many parts of the world, Lord. Um, and we give you thanks that um, this island, Lord, is free from from the pandemic, we um, ask, Lord, that uh, we rest in, the, in Christ Jesus, who uh, has paid it all for us, Lord, and um, no matter what happens, Lord, uh, keep us focused, um, our rest in you, Lord, you promised protection, um, and um, no matter what happens, Lord, um, we rest in you. Strengthen our faith, we pray. Also, too, Lord, I want to pray for the people in, in um, Afghanistan. Uh, events have overtaken them very quickly, Lord. Um, it reminds us, too, Lord, how uh, you are coming soon and um, events will overtake this world the same way. But we pray, Lord, for Christians that um, are trapped in that country, um, have been hunted down, Lord, and I just pray that... Um, assistance can be delivered, um, that they will find a safe way to get through to the airport to be rescued, Lord. Um, you have your uh, unseen angels, Lord, about, and I pray, Lord, that um, uh, things will happen for their relief, Lord. Um, this I pray in the name of Jesus, Lord, who um, died for our sins, I pray in his name. Amen. 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 Our Father, we thank you this morning that we can kneel and be sure that we have access to your heart through the Lord Jesus. We thank you, Father, that uh, you have so treasured us and so loved us that you have chosen to lay our sins and our guilt and our failure on yourself in your Son. And that you that you treat us just as if we had never sinned because of Jesus. Father, we are very grateful for that, that knowledge this morning. But Father, we are very aware that, that your displeasure is being at uh, the sinfulness of, and the rebellion of the world is being displayed everywhere as you withdraw your presence. And Father, we pray earnestly that in situations such as in, in the... Uh, COVID crisis and in Kabul and in so many places, your spirit will lead us to seek you out as never before and to, and to lead us into a spirit of repentance whereby we put away those things that are displeasing in your sight. <coughs> we pray, loving Father, that, that, uh, that, you, that you will draw close through this crisis and, and uh, people will come to know you and to experience your, your goodness in their lives. I would also like to thank you, Father, we all would, for your grace and your, your blessing in Trish and Kevin's life. And we pray, loving Father, that uh, you will draw very close to them as their son continues to recover uh, in, in, in Brisbane. We pray that, that, that each one, uh, um, Troy and Trish and, and Kevin, I sense you drawing close in saying, my son, my daughter, give me your heart. Trust me with this situation. May 
they may they experience that power we pray, please, in Jesus' name. Amen. Father, we thank you that you have asked us to come to you and to bring our burdens and cast them upon your shoulders. And this morning, Father, that is just what we wish to do. We seem to be a little oasis surrounded by this COVID pandemic, Father, and for your grace in that, we thank you. But we are mindful, Lord, that there are so many who are suffering, many families suffering through loss, many families impacted by shutdown by, and lockdown, and a seemingly endless um, no hope uh, future for this whole COVID pandemic. We think of Australia, we think of New Zealand, we think of Fiji and other Pacific Islands, Lord, that are suffering as well, to say nothing of what is happening around the rest of the world. And we simply come to you, Lord, and ask please that you will intervene that for those who are in the front line, for those who are having to call the big shots, that you'll give them wisdom to know just what to do to help to curtail this pandemic and its impact. Um, and for those, uh, Lord, who are working with people that have the COVID, that you'll give them the skills and the, uh, the energy, the courage, the strength just to keep battling on so that hopefully, Lord, one day we'll see this pandemic ease right, right off. We think of the unfolding situation of chaos in Afghanistan at the moment, Lord. We pray especially for those that believe in you, that you will place your angels around them to continue to protect them, but to give them courage as well. But not only for them, Father, there are many others, some who don't even know you. We pray that your spirit will touch their lives just the same, that uh, you'll make no distinction between those that believe and those that don't. That in this situation, Father, many will come to know you, many will come to appreciate your power and your might, and that many will be saved in spite of the chaos that is everywhere around them. We thank you, Lord, that you do have your hand over the affairs of this earth, and we pray that that may yet continue. This morning, Lord, we give you thanks for Troy's uh, operation that has come through that um, fairly well. And I pray for Kevin and Trish and, uh, and for Troy too, Lord, that they may place this burden upon you, that they may trust you. And that, uh, 
Troy will continue to make a good recovery, please. We thank you for the schools that you gave to the surgeons and their support staff, and I pray that that may continue too. We think of Jim too, Father, up on the randa there, up in our local hospital, and we think of Liz. We pray that you will continue to bless her, uh, give her that uh, strength and the courage that she needs as she uh, um, works uh, with Jim and the staff at the hospital there. Um, keep her hope firmly based in you, please, we pray. We thank you, Father, that we can uh, come to you Again, we thank you that we can place our burdens on your shoulder. We pray that you'll help us to do that figuratively, take it off our shoulders and place it on yours, squarely on yours. Help us not to take it back again, but help us just to let it be with you. Now, Lord, as we um, carry on with the rest of our, our worship time this morning, we pray again that your Holy Spirit will be present and that each of us here will be richly blessed today, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, uh, Snow, the sole, sole deacon on duty today. Would you like to come and uplift our offering, offering please? Thank you. Father, we thank you again that we can return to you what is already yours in the first place. We thank you for the blessings of life, for health and strength, and for the opportunity now to return these offerings and tithes to you. Bless them, we pray, in Jesus' name. Amen. Is your scripture reading up on the screen? All right, our scripture reading for today comes from Galatians chapter 5, verses 19 to 22. When you follow the desires of your sinful nature, the results are very clear. Sexual immorality, impurity, lustful pleasures, idolatry, sorcery, hostility, quarrelling, jealousy, outbursts of anger, selfish ambition, dissension, division, envy, drunkenness, wild parties and other sins like these. Let me tell you again, as I have before, that anyone living that sort of life will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness. All right, let's join together, shall we? Jesus, keep me near the cross, hymn number 312.
speaker this morning is not myself. Sarah McDougall, her name is, and she is a, an abuse prevention coach. She's going to address us on the subject of bringing love home, addressing youth violence at its roots. Uh, she chose the scripture reading this morning, by the way, from, from Galatians, which in itself is quite confronting, isn't it? It says that our human nature, unaided, produces all sorts of less than savoury behaviours. Uh, but that the fruit of the Spirit brings real, uh, real uh, beauty and joy into our lives. And so Sarah McDougall is going to talk to us about that this morning, and uh, we'll have a brief reflection at the end. But I invite you now to listen to what she has to say by video. Thank you. Once upon a time, there was a little person who felt special. The little person always wanted their own way. What other people wanted or needed didn't matter to the little person who became selfish. While other people were learning to put others' needs first, this little person didn't. And the little person began expecting and demanding their own way. The little person grew up and became a big little person. When the big little person tried the same selfish demands to get their own way with other grown-ups, it didn't work as well as it had before. Instead of focusing on being kind and helpful to others, the big little person began a habit of doing dishonest things and hurting people to get their own way, even though being dishonest and hurting people is wrong. Because the big little person was always nice to the people in charge, they thought the big little person was wonderful. Soon, the people in charge allowed the big little person to take more and more power. The big little person appeared to live happily ever after, but the people close to the big little person suffered. In the end, the big little person who learned to like being cruel ended up suffering too. Because the big little person who wanted their own way never experienced the joy of unselfishness, helpfulness, and kindness. One day, when the people in charge realized the big little person was cruel to others, they decided to stop giving power to the big little person. That was the day when other people in the community were no longer being hurt by the big little person, and they were able to begin healing from their wounds to experience true love and safety. Today's world is a dangerous place for our children and youth to grow up. If we are courageous enough to look, the statistics of violence, bullying, and assault are alarming in every country. Technology has expanded the potential for youthful cruelty by making it possible to cyber-bully one's peers without risking exposure or harm to oneself. Before we can explore the tangible ways to address this problem, we must first have a better understanding of what our youth are facing on a daily basis in today's world. These statistics may be disturbing and very uncomfortable to hear. But for our community of faith, they are crucial to know if we want to be aware and able to truly impact the way things are. We must also remember that many of the families in our congregations and communities are living with the impact of this data, which makes it an important theme to discuss in the church, even if it is not comfortable to do so. According to the World Health Organization, youth violence is a global public health problem. It includes a range of acts from bullying and physical fighting to more severe sexual and physical assault to homicide. About 200,000 homicides occur worldwide every year around the world among the youth aged 10 to 29 years old. This is close to half 43% of the total number of homicides globally each year. Homicide is the fourth leading cause of death from ages 10 to 29, and 83% of these involve male victims. 
for each young person killed. Many more sustain injuries requiring hospital treatment. In one study, up to 24% of women report that their first sexual experience was forced. While it is not fatal, youth violence has a serious, often lifelong impact on physical, psychological, and social functioning. Youth violence greatly increases the costs of health, welfare, and criminal justice services. It reduces productivity and decreases the value of property. According to rain.org, the rates of sexual violence to children under the age of 18 is chilling. One in nine girls and one in 53 boys under the age of 18 experience sexual abuse or assault at the hands of an adult. 82% of all victims under 18 are female. Females ages 16 to 19 are four times more likely than the general population to be victims of rape, attempted rape, or sexual assault. Nine out of 10 victims of rape are female. The effects of child sexual abuse can be long lasting and affect the victim's mental health, increasing their risks and making them about four times more likely to develop symptoms of drug abuse, about four times more likely to experience post-traumatic stress as adults, about three times more likely to experience a major depressive episode as adults. So as loving parents, teachers, and church community leaders, how can we keep our children safe? What can we do to protect the next generation and help them develop into healthy, whole, strong, confident, safe adults? Statistics show that home, where children are supposed to be surrounded by adults and other youth whom they love and trust, is often the most unsafe place. Data shows that when cases of child sexual abuse are reported to law enforcement, 93% of perpetrators are known to the child. And of that number, 34% are family members or relatives, while only 7% of perpetrators are actually strangers to the child. The terrifying reality is that far too often, the place where our children begin experiencing violence is inside the home, even inside the Christian home. The World Health Organization also states that adverse childhood experiences, called ACEs, are some of the most intensive and frequently occurring sources of stress that children may suffer early in life. These adverse experiences can include verbal, physical, sexual, or psychological abuse, various forms of neglect, violence between parents or caregivers, serious dysfunctions such as alcohol, substance, or pornography addiction, as well as outright violence among peers or in the community. It has been shown that considerable and prolonged stress in childhood has lifelong consequences for a person's health and well-being. It can disrupt early brain development and compromise functioning of the nervous and immune systems. In addition, because of the behaviors adopted by some people who have faced ACEs, adverse childhood experiences, such stress can lead to serious problems like alcoholism, depression, eating disorders, unsafe sex, HIV or AIDS, heart disease, cancer, and other chronic diseases later in life. When describing Christ's childhood, Luke 2, 52 tells us that Jesus grew in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and all the people. This tells us three things about his childhood. One, that he grew in psychological and spiritual maturity, in wisdom. He grew in physical health and strength, in stature. And he grew in favor with God and the people. Character and personality. Ellen White also writes about these three attributes of Jesus. Wonderful in its significance is the brief record of his early life. 
the child grew and waxed strong in spirit, filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. Luke 2.52 His mind was active and penetrating with a thoughtfulness and a wisdom beyond his years. Yet his character was beautiful in its symmetry. The powers of mind and body developed gradually in keeping with the laws of childhood. In order to have the greatest opportunity to grow in wisdom, stature, and favor, like Jesus did, our children need protection and safety to develop with balance and wholeness. This means they not only need physical safety, but also emotional, spiritual, sexual, and psychological safety. The solutions for preventing adverse childhood experiences must begin in the Christian home. We love our precious children. We love them fiercely and fully. We want the best for them, but often we fail to realize that we are preparing them for lives marred by violence by subjecting them to a lack of safety right at home. If our children are watching parents fight or seeing their father attack their mother, home is not safe. If they are being molested or abused sexually by family or trusted friends, home is not safe. If they are living in fear of your criticism and harsh words, home is not safe. If their mistakes and failures are used to shame and control them instead of to teach and empower them, home is not safe. If they are not free to express emotions and fears and concerns, home isn't safe. If they are silent on spiritual topics because they've been told God won't love them if they ask questions, then home is not safe. If they observe fathers and male relatives exercising their power to exploit women instead of leading like Jesus by serving and protecting, home is not safe. We cannot control the world around us, but we do have an undeniable responsibility before God to raise our children in safe, gentle homes that reflect the tenderness and the love of Christ's character. The atmosphere surrounding the souls of fathers and mothers fills the whole house and is felt in every department of the home. In order to address the epidemic of aggression among our youth, in order to reduce dating violence, peer bullying, child sexual assault, and teen homicide, we must assess the cultural norms that exist inside our homes. We must first address ourselves as parents, grandparents, aunties, uncles, and family friends. When our homes are structured on the concepts of power and control, we unwittingly perpetuate cycles of aggression, anger, and hopelessness back out into the community. The first step to ending these painful cycles is to break the silence and bring the subject into the light. The Apostle John writes, God's light came into the world, but people loved the darkness more than the light, for their actions were evil. All who do evil hate the light and refuse to go near it, for fear their sins will be exposed. But those who do what is right come to the light, so others can see that they are doing what God wants. John 3, 19-21. No matter how awkward it may feel, we must begin discussing reality in a way that allows for honesty and leads to change. When we, as a global church, avoid uncomfortable topics, preferring to keep things secret and hidden, we allow violence to flourish in private. The only way to dispel the darkness is to shine the light of truth upon it and to bring it into the sterilizing sunshine of God's character. John tells us that if someone keeps evil hidden in the dark, they are not true followers of God. Church communities can unknowingly promote ways of thinking that increase abusive patterns of behavior because we idolize those who wield power. But wait, 
Isn't power a good thing? It can be, but power unchecked corrupts quickly. As followers of Christ, we are called to treat each other not by power over and control, but according to the fruit of the Spirit. The Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. The apostle writes, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Galatians 5, 22. When we focus on exerting power over others, controlling the choices of others, and forcing our will onto others, we easily forget that only Lucifer sought for power. Satan seeks to take, to possess, to control. Christ seeks to give. Jesus and the Father are one in their identity of love. Together, they employ only the tools of love and truth to invite us to accept salvation. Every other tool, forcefulness, deception, manipulation, trickery, bribery, intimidation, deflection, isolation, enticement, all of these are tools of the devil, not of God. We cannot use these tools in our parenting, our romantic relationships, our marriages, or our ministries without taking on the characteristics of Satan. When church people, members or leaders, focus on power instead of servanthood, whether in our marriages, our classes, our small groups, or in our congregation and the community at large, we perpetuate an atmosphere that makes abuse thrive. We seek to hold the power of God without possessing the character of God. Then, We are heartbroken when our children grow up into youth who have seen abuse modeled as their norm and they follow in our emotionally, verbally, physically, or spiritually violent footsteps. Possessing power without also possessing the character of God is evidence of sin that must be exposed to the light of God's truth. Until we break the cycle of abuse. We are not following Jesus' command to love one another and to live in the light. He says anyone who loves another brother or sister is living in the light and does not cause others to stumble. But anyone who hates or abuses another brother or sister is still living and walking in darkness. 1 John 2, 10 and 11. When we exhibit the fortitude required to talk openly and honestly about creating homes filled with kindness and compassion, when we refuse to protect and enable the familiar habits that endorse a spirit of violence and aggression toward the next generation, the church can begin to experience revival and healing. Until we do this, We are collectively stealing the treasure of safety and trust from our children's hearts. In doing so, we misrepresent the character of God and transgress the third commandment, which says you must not misuse the name of the Lord your God. The Lord will not let you go unpunished if you misuse his name. Exodus chapter 20, verse 7. As members of the body of Christ, we claim to reflect the name of God. When our daily example does not showcase the fruit of the Spirit, we are taking God's name in vain. In Galatians chapter 5, Paul tells us that when we follow the desires of our sinful nature, the results are very clear. Sexual immorality, impurity, lustful pleasures, idolatry, sorcery, hostility, quarreling, jealousy, outbursts of anger, selfish ambition, dissension, division, envy, drunkenness, wild parties, and other sins like these. Let me tell you again, as I have before, that anyone living that sort of life will not inherit the kingdom of God. Galatians 5, 19 to 21. It may be uncomfortable to recognize that far too often we treat our family at home with more hostility, 
quarreling, jealousy, angry outbursts, envy, and other forms of emotional and physical and spiritual aggression than we may exhibit anywhere else. Our spouses and our children become easy targets for frustration, exhaustion, or irritability. Then they grow up believing these patterns of behavior are normal and they treat siblings, peers, romantic partners, and their future families in the same generational pattern. Ellen White wrote in great detail about home life and the importance of kindness and mutual respect. Home, she says, should be a little heaven upon earth a place where the affections are cultivated instead of being studiously repressed. Our happiness depends upon this cultivation of love, sympathy, and true courtesy to one another. The sweetest type of heaven is a home where the spirit of the Lord presides. If the will of God is fulfilled, the husband and wife will respect each other and cultivate love and confidence. Never forget that you are to make the home bright and happy for yourselves and your children, she says, by cherishing the Savior's attributes. Troubles may invade, but these are the lot of humanity. Let patience, gratitude, and love keep sunshine in the heart, though the day be ever so cloudy. The home may be plain, but it can always be a place where cheerful words are spoken and kindly deeds are done, where courtesy and love are abiding guests. You know, this attitude at home doesn't depend on wealth, it doesn't depend on gender, and it doesn't depend on cultural norms. It hinges purely on our willingness to imitate Jesus Christ and to model his heart of love to our youth and our children. Jesus Christ must be our reference and the center of our attitudes at home. This is not a calling only for mothers either. It is an expectation of all male and female who claim to follow Jesus Christ and to be filled with the Spirit. Men and women, boys and girls. Ellen White says, neither the husband nor the wife should attempt to exercise over the other an arbitrary control. Do not try to compel each other to yield to your wishes. You cannot do this and retain each other's love. Be kind, patient, and forbearing, considerate, and courteous. Scripture calls us to show love by speaking truth about violence. What sorrow for those who say that evil is good and good is evil, that dark is light and light is dark, that bitter is sweet and sweet is bitter. Isaiah 5.20. In Ephesians 5.11-13, Paul instructs us clearly to not participate in darkness, to expose the deeds of darkness, to use his light to make things visible, and to expose sin in the light of truth. When we minimize at-home examples of violence to our children, accepting aggressive cultural patterns as normal, and making the abuse of power appear to be less harmful than it is in God's eyes, we are acting in opposition to God's heart of love. As long as violence thrives in silence within the households of the faith community, As long as our churches conduct evangelism and outreach using methods based on power or forcefulness, as long as we embrace the aspects of our local cultures that endorse and encourage an attitude of control over others, we are modeling to our youth that violence is normal, that it is not safe for them to report harm, and that the mindset of domination and entitlement is an acceptable substitution for God's sacrificial love. But if we choose, we can show our young people how to end violence and to end it now. But this means we must look in the mirror. We must address our own violence, our own aggression, our own cultural senses of entitlement to power and control over others. And how do we begin to do that? We begin 
by being willing to do whatever it takes to break the silence of violence and to end it now. Silence is not how God defines loving others well. Isaiah chapter 58 verses 1, 2, 6, and 7 in scripture says to speak out. Silence is not the way to inspire abusers to embrace humble change. Scripture says in Ephesians 5, 11 to 13, that we should hold each other accountable. Silence is not part of the biblical process of forgiveness. Scripture says to rebuke those who harm the little ones in Luke 17, 3. Silence does not bring transformation. Scripture shows that covering sin brings calamity to the entire community. Just read Joshua chapters 7, 8, and 9. Silence does not facilitate healing. Silence does not save the lambs. We are called to break the silence, to end it now. God's compassion compels the body of Christ to also respond compassionately to the needs that are created as the consequence of abuse. In doing so, Victims who are broken by all forms of abuse are given the opportunity to heal and to rebuild their lives. May God bless you and me as we pray, speak, and work together against violence to break the silence and to end it now. I think you'll agree that uh, she makes a very good and searching point, doesn't she, when she challenges us to realize that abuse always begins in the atmosphere that we create in our homes. You will remember, won't you, that Jesus said to us as his disciples, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. And as I read scripture, I discover that the place where Jesus' love is most powerfully exemplified is in the marriage relationship. Do you remember Ephesians chapter 5 that talks about the fact that uh, wives are called upon to submit to their own husbands as to the Lord and that husbands are called upon to love their wives as themselves to get, and to give themselves up for her just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. So in that mutual arrangement of husbands giving up themselves for their wives and wives giving up their rights for their, uh, for their husband's uh, leadership, we find the perfect example of a, a happy and a, a violence-free home. I don't know about you folk, but uh, I feel, as I think on these, uh, these uh, topics, that I very much need the, the Spirit of God to li live in me, as, pr as God promises. He promises that uh, he himself will live out his life in uh, our experience. And so that's our hymn this morning. And I wonder, Snow, if you'd like to uh, read, um, bring that up for us. Take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to thee. Let's make this our heartfelt prayer this morning, that the fruits of the Spirit might be seen and experienced in us rather than the fruits of the flesh. I'm saying.
parting benediction, let's listen to the words of God. For this is the kind of fast that I want. To free those who are, who are wrongly imprisoned. To lighten the burden of those who work uh, for, for you. To let the oppressed go free and remove the chains that bind people. To share your food with the hungry and to give shel shelter to the hungry to give clothes to those that need them and uh, not to hide yourselves from those who need your help. Then your salvation will become like the dawn and you, your wounds will be quickly healed. Your um, godliness will lead you forward and the glory of the Lord will protect you from behind. Then when you call, the Lord will answer, Yes, I am here. He will quickly reply. And now, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of his Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. God be with you.